Hey everyone, it's really terrific to be with all of you and to see everyone uh, who's on this call, uh, whether uh, old friends or people that have studied here and we've been in conversation with for years or those of you who uh, have had no connection to Duke before, it's really a pleasure. Uh, my name is Warren Kinghorn. I'm the co-director along with Bar Curlin of the Theology, Medicine and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School. So grateful to Brendan for getting us started. Uh, he's one of our, our, our Theology, Medicine and Culture fellows. Uh, we exist in the Theology, Medicine and Culture Initiative to connect the world of Christian faith and practice with the world of healthcare. And this seminar series is an important set of conversations that helps us to advance that goal. So thanks to all of you for participating with us in that. Um, this is the first time, as Brendan said, that we've done this online. We've always previously had these seminars in a conference room and really focused on conversation and connection. We're trying to figure out the right way to do this over Zoom. So as you noted, we've, uh, we've continued to do this as a regular Zoom call, but uh, we will uh, value your feedback and how to make this an, an effective online experience. Um, but mainly we want you to feel welcome and uh, thank you for, uh, for being here today. And we're really excited about the conversation that's in front of us today and also the conversations that are in front of us uh, the rest of the semester in, in future seminars. We also are grateful for the Trent Center for Bioethics, Medical Humanities and the History of Medicine for helping us to co-sponsor um, these events and for their partnership. Um, with that, though, I want to introduce our, uh, our speaker for today, uh, which is Professor John Swinton. John, if you could turn on your video. Great to see you. So, uh, so John, I hardly recognize you. You have a beard now, unlike your profile picture. So. I'm in disguise so, uh, at the moment. That's right. So, uh, so welcome. Uh, Dr. John Swinton is Professor in Practical Theology and Pastoral Care and Chair in Divinity and Religious Studies at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And, uh, and is also a longtime friend and collaborator and partner of, of ours here in Theology, Medicine, and Culture. So, John, we haven't seen each other in person for quite a while due to the pandemic, yeah. and you were in Australia for a lot of last year, I think. And so we want to get you back to Duke uh, in person when we can, but uh, until now, we're really delighted that you're here with us uh, for this conversation and this, and this seminar. So thank yeah. you so much for, for joining us. Um, we're going to focus this conversationally, uh, John, just to, to give everyone a chance to, to you know, hear about your story and to be in conversation with you. But we're going to center it on this book that is not yet out. I just learned in a few minutes ago that I have this book before John Swinton himself does. But uh, this is the latest book by uh, Dr. Swinton called Finding Jesus in the Storm, The Spiritual Lives of Christians with Mental Health Challenges. Um, and it's uh, just published, it's hot off the press, and uh, that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. Um, so, uh, John, let me just start with questions, and then we'll be in conversation for about uh, 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up to conversation from the, from the group. Uh, we have a lot of folks here today who've never met you, so tell us a bit about yourself. And uh, I also should just mention that, you know, before you... Uh, were trained as a practical theologian, you were, you are, and were a nurse, uh, specifically a mental health nurse and a nurse for people with disabilities. So tell us a bit how you came into nursing and then into ministry uh, in your role as an ordained minister in the Church of Scotland and into your current work as a practical theologian. Oh, well, well first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's really nice to be here. And it's, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you for ages, as you say. So it's good. Uh, how did I get into nursing? Well, it's a bit, <clears throat> it's a bit weird, really, because when I left school, I, uh, I got a job as a scientist, which, if you know my statistical ability and mathematical abilities, it's quite funny now. And I did that for about a year, and I get fed up with that. Uh, and then I, I drove a van for a year. It was great. I had no responsibilities, so I just got up in the morning, did my job, and then I, uh, I went home at night. It's probably the, the best part of my life in some ways, like, or less stressful. And then one of my friends became a mental health nurse. And so I said, oh, I can quite fancy becoming a mental health nurse. And so I became a mental health nurse. It was just as simple as that. Like, there was no mystery. There was no great calling. I just, was just one of my friends did. Uh, and so I thought I'd do the same. But I loved it. I, t I trained originally in psychiatry and worked for a few years there. And then I retrained in um, 
what was then called mental deficiency, which is now called intellectual disability or learning disability, depending on which part of the world you're in. And I worked there for a number of years um, and I loved it. I, I really did enjoy nursing. I enjoyed spending time with people that see the world differently. And that, you know, because you, you, you begin to see the world differently yourself when, you, when you're with people who see the world differently. And then probably around about uh, 1989, I decided to do something different. Uh, I decided to go and study theology. Now, I thought at that time I'd end up as a hospital chaplain. Um, and I did, I worked as a chaplain for a little while. But as soon as I uh, got to university, and as soon as I had my first class in practical theology, I knew that I wanted to teach practical theology which is kind of strange because that first class in practical theology was more or less this. It was don't throw stones at coffins uh, when you're doing funerals because um, uh, families get upset. In other words, take the stones out of, your, out of the earth and throw in the earth. And practical theology is a bit like that. And thankfully, it's not quite like that. But it was handy ho ho household hints for ministers. But there was something about that class and something about th that subject that I, I just knew was my, my, voc my new vocation. And so I, I, I finished my degrees, uh, worked down in Glasgow for a, a year, and then came back to Aberdeen. And I've been in Aberdeen now for, in Aberdeen University for 20, 21, maybe 22 years now. So I'm one of the old school. Yeah. So you're, uh, by my count, this new book that I have is about your ninth or 10th book or so. And uh, we, congratulations on that, first of all, and congratulations for this, uh, this one to come out. I know it's been a, it's been a long, a long road, uh, and for this book in particular, but you're, you've written a number of really quite beautiful books on dementia, on mental illness more broadly, on, uh, on coping with evil, on, uh, on a variety of different kinds of topics on disability. And I wonder if you could talk about how your writing has emerged out of your work as a nurse and, yeah. uh, and out of your work as an, as an ordained minister. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think that's, that's a really good question. I mean, the way I look at it is that my <clears throat> nursing and chaplaincy work was my place of formation. So it shaped and formed me to, to see the world in particular ways. Because you know, if, you, if you're with people with severe mental health challenges or if you're people with profound intellectual disabilities, suddenly a lot of the things that culturally you assume to be normal uh, become abnormal. So you, begin, you know, culturally we assume that intellect and reason and memory are profoundly important. But then you would come along to say people who uh, just for whom these things are not profoundly important, but there's other ways of being human beyond the way that kind of we, we culturally construct things. So that kind of formed and shaped me to see the world in, in a quite particular way. So that's my place of formation. Then my place of, uh, when I came to, into academia, I was really my place of vocation, if you like, where I took the things that I had lived through and lived with and began to think about them in a theological context. Which means that, in, in a real sense, I bring a set of questions to the conversation, the theological conversation, that perhaps others with a different formation don't bring. And so that's maybe the gift that's been given to me, that I can ask questions of tradition, uh, to us in the vote of the church, um, because I, 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 I know because the questions that emerge from me are slightly different because they've been shaped and formed in a different way. So the two things are, are absolutely welded together. I couldn't do one without the other, and I certainly couldn't do what I do now without having that, uh, these formative years in, in healthcare. Yeah. Well, let's jump into that specifically. So th there's a lot in this new book, that uh, Finding Jesus in the Storm. Uh, there's anecdotes, there's engagement with other authors, and so on. But the core of this book is something that's not been as prominent in your previous books, and that's a series of structured interviews with people, mostly Christians, who live with mental health challenges. And in describing why you've done these interviews, you use a word that doesn't come naturally to most clinicians, which, which is phenomenology. And you also make a couple of contrasts in this book. One is between explanation on one hand and understanding on the other. And then you also use these terms, thin description and thick description. So all at once, I've just thrown a bunch of terms out on the table, <laughs> phenomenology, explanation, understanding, different forms of description. Um, could you unpack those concepts for us? Um, and why, why did it matter for this book that you interviewed people? 
Uh, well, I'll take, I'll take that question f first before I go into the other stuff. Um, for the past few years, myself and a number of other theologians, um, most notably Pete Ward at the University of Durham, have been working on the idea of ecclesial ethnography. So using ethnography primarily for theological ends. So if systematic theology uh, uses Bible and tradition and philosophy to explore the, the text and the history and tradition of the church. Um, ecclesial uh, 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 ethnography builds upon that by looking at or trying to look at what God is doing in the world. So the actual experience of God in the world, which is done equally as rigorously, but assuming that God is doing something. And so they use qualitative research me methods to uh, explore congregational issues or human issues in that way. And so out of that <coughs> uh, is where that, this project kind of finds its methodological route. But the reason I, I, I think it's important to listen to people's experiences in that sense is because very often they're very different from the way that we assume them to be. I mean, one of the things that I mean, everybody will be familiar with this is, is that um, mental health diagnoses in particular are very powerful shapers and formers of the way that we look at people. So if you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and you already think you know what that is, then the chances are you'll, you'll see that, and that's absolutely fine. But in focusing in on that, because it functions like a lens, there's other dimensions that you really don't see. And it's these other dimensions that you really don't see that I think are profoundly important theologically, but also profoundly important from the perspective of the individual. Because if you're only looking at one part, you miss some very important things. And so the basic method that uh, I use in, in this particular book is, as you say, phenomen oh, it's a derivation of phenomenology. So phenomenology um, uh, is a way of doing philosophy, a way of looking at the world where you put to one side your normal assumptions about the way something should be. And so if we're looking, for example, at, at, at depression, you know, all of us have theories of depression and assumptions about what depression is. Well, for the purposes of phenomen phenomenological look, you put these to one side, bracket them if you like, and you try to get to the actual experience as the person is, is living it in that way. But, but of course, in reality, you can't actually bracket everything else. And this is where the derivation comes in, because <clears throat> there's an interpretative process that goes on in the study, because you bring something of yourself, your, your own history, your knowledge, your understanding of the world. And the way it works out in that, that, that um, st uh, book is that phenomenolo phenomenology helps you to get to the lived experience, but then we bring our own experience to that and we try to make sense or to understand rather than to explain uh, people's experiences. And so a standard empirical scientific study would try to explain something. The reason why you have schizophrenia, the reason why you have bipolar disorder, whatever it is, and that's absolutely valid as it should be. Um, but a phenomenological approach tries to understand what does it feel like to hear voices? What role do these voices play in your social structure? What does it feel like to have extreme highs and lows? How do you use that impact upon your faith life? What does it mean to encounter God in an intense way in a psychotic experience and then to have to reflect on that later on and to see what is uh, what is truly of God in that sense, and what is just something that has come because of, of the, 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 uh, the more pathological dimensions of somebody's experience in that way. So that's a, that's a tension between, uh, well, the difference between description and understanding as, as, as uh, I work out. But description itself is actually very important because the way that you describe something determines what you think you see, and what you think you see determines how you respond to what you think you see. So if, for example, you think, uh, you have, you think that um, all mental health challenges are purely biological, the chances are that's what you'll see. Uh, and there's lots of good things that you can see when you, when you do that. But the problem is that that's probably all you will see, or the danger is that it's all you will see. And there's a whole realm of experience over here which can, uh, can be described differently uh, and it's that different mode of description. And I think theology is a way of, of describing things differently amongst other things. It's that different mode of description of standard accounts of, of mental health experiences 
that I've tried to capture in that book. Yeah, that's really helpful. And and I want to get to some of the this question of what does it feel like for people and some of the stories that you tell uh, very shortly. But maybe to stay for just a minute at some of the things that they get in the way. You mentioned that uh, in your opinion, and I would agree with this as a psychiatrist, sometimes neurobiological explanation can get in the way of that, of really seeing how people, uh, it, uh, uh, what does it feel like to uh, experience mental health challenges. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned a few things, and I guess I, I just want to follow up on that. Like, how, how does that happen? Why, why is it that neuro, neurobiological explanation gets in the way? And you also have this really interesting comment at some point that in, in our culture, sometimes neuroscience does work that's left undone by theology. That's true. And I wonder if you could just comment on that. Okay, well, I, I would separate uh, neuroscience as a discipline from neuroscience as a reductive discipline, right? It's neuroscience and it's, it's reductive dimensions that is that's problematic for me. Because neuroscience be very easily becomes a theory of everything, including the theory of religion, or the origins of religion. And so if it is the only story that you tell about human beings, then eventually we just simply become a series of neurological impulses and movements. And you, you lose certain crucial dimensions, certain uh, crucial theological dimensions. Um, but one of these things is that the danger is in its reductionist form that it begins to answer what would be traditionally called spiritual questions. So who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going to and why? Can all be answered if you, uh, by neuroscience. Uh, without any recourse to philosophy, really, or any recourse to theology, and that's where that's where that's what I mean by that. That that we that this, the, working out the actual goal and telos of human beings can be easily um, hijacked by the powerful structures of neuroscience. Now, I don't have any problem with neuroscience. It's not it's not anti neuroscience. It's anti any form of reductionism that can only see a single perspective. And, and, and seeing that single perspective, it, it occludes and excludes other perspectives. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I also wonder sometimes if neuroscience is invoked to uh, help to account for why we can't do what we want to be able to do or what we think we ought to be able to do in ways that, um, in ways that you know, Christians have had other ways to account for that, you know, over, over time. So, yeah. Let's get to these stories. One of the things that I appreciate about this book is that the stories are complex and messy. Um, and this seems right because people, including you, know, you and me, are complex and messy. And uh, you dedicate the book to one of your interviewees named Alan Walker, which happens to be his real name, uh, unlike most of your uh, interviewees. Tell us something of Alan's story. What did you learn from him? And what does he have to teach us? Well, Alan was, um, uh, he, he, he's done many things in, in life. He was a divinity student for a little while. He was, uh, he actually worked in neurobiology. He's a very bright man, but also had uh, lived with um, quite severe schizophrenia. And um, I'd known him for, for many, many years in a lot of different guises. And um, he was very keen to participate in this project. Um, now, tragically, over the this, last time I spoke with him, probably would be about mm, four years ago, just when I was beginning to think about this project. Uh, and sadly, since then, Alan took his own life. And so the reason that the book is dedicated to him in his own name is because uh, his mother, I spoke to his mother, and she felt, and I felt, it was, it was a fitting tribute for him. So in that sense, the dedication is just for him and his, his life. But I learned a lot of things from him. I learned that uh, voices, for example, um, can be absolutely devastating, but also that voices can actually be quite encouraging. He sometimes had really bad voices, terrible voices, and it may well be that that's, that was one of the reasons why he ended his life. But he also had very supportive voices. So I began to think when I started spoken to Alan, there's something interesting about voices that uh, sometimes we miss, the idea that they're, they're vicious and violent, but also supportive. And I think you know, a part of somebody's social circle in that sense. Um, 
I learned a lot about him in relation to uh, stigma and love. I remember him telling me that um, he used to go to uh, his work on a bus and every day he sat beside this, this woman, they were very friendly. And a few months later, he had a psychotic breakdown and he went to the uh, his psychiatrist, he spent some time with the psychiatrist and eventually he got a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Uh, and I remember he, he said to me, I was just so disappointed, he said, my life was over. And so he just equated that idea, that I get this diagnosis, my life is over. And he went back home in the bus and he spoke to the, the woman that he'd been speaking to for months, told him of his diagnosis and she got off the bus and never spoke to him again. She just stood up and went off. And he went back home and um, he said to his mom, mom, I've got schizophrenia, my life is over. And his mom said, no, Alan. She said, uh, you uh, have schizophrenia, but you're not a schizophrenic. She said, you're Alan and I love you. And I just found that incredibly powerful that a mother's love in that situation can really take on board the pain of stigma and alienation and put them into, put somebody into a position where they feel lovable, even though culturally the emphasis seems to be on the unlovability of their situation. You mentioned in uh, your previous work and also it comes up here about the distinction between inclusion and belonging as that relates to faith communities, but also to how people with mental health challenges live in our communities more broadly. Can you, can you talk about that distinction? Yeah, well, inclusion is a, is a, is a political term, so, uh, and, or, uh, or it's a legal term. So in order to include people with disabilities or mental health challenges, you have to have certain legislation that makes sure that people don't discriminate against them. And so, you have to have access to buildings, you have to have uh, particular structures in place to enable everybody to participate in that way. But the problem with inclusion is that you, you have no obligation to like or to love the individual. And so I prefer the language of belonging. So to belong, uh, you have to be missed. Somebody has to miss you in your community for you to belong. It's quite easy to be included, you just have to be in the room. But to belong, you have to be missed. So therefore you have to have certain types of relationships, you have to have certain modes of community, you have to have certain people around you that make you feel that you belong to that place. So Alan's mum is a good example of how he makes him feel like he belongs in a context where everybody else seems to think he shouldn't do. And I think that's really, that, that distinction is really, really helpful because if we're thinking about Christian communities, it's not enough simply to be inclusive um, uh, and to, to, to meet the rules and the guidelines. We need to become communities of belonging where people really do miss those whom society may just reject. Yeah, that's so beautiful, thank you. And, and Alan's mother was in some ways holding him, holding his, yeah. Holding his identity and his self in trust for him exactly in many right. ways, and and I, and still is, it sounds like. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's nice to put. Thank you for sharing Alan's story and for and for for honoring him and and for his contribution. I want to mention another story that you tell that I found I found quite moving. It, um, you you speak of the phenomenon of voice hearing, uh, which that term may not be familiar to everyone on the call, and of the Hearing Voices Network. And I'd love for you to say just a little bit about that. Like, what is that? But you, you told the story of a very interesting woman named, you named Alice, who heard voices at a particular point in her life, and then they went away. Um, what, did, what did you learn from Alice, and how did this connect to her, her faith? Yeah, Alice was very interesting. Because, as you say, she, she had very severe hallucinations. Uh, and vo voice hearing is what um, professionals would call um, or, 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 oral hallucinations. She used to have to do tips. I mean, she, they, they would, for example, they'd take her to a supermarket and she'd have to stand and stop. And she'd be standing there for, for, for sometimes hours, she felt like. She said, it's really embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, 
this, it was just really powerful the way she told the story. But then when she was uh, in her uh, early 20s, if I remember correctly, the voice had disappeared. Um, and at one level, Alice was delighted about this. And she, the way that she framed it was that there was a group of people who, a group of women who had been praying for her for some time. Uh, and she put it down as supernatural healing in that sense. Even though they hadn't been praying for her healing, just been praying for her. Her psychologist uh, put it down to misdiagnosis. So somewhere in between there is, lies the truth. But either way, she, did, she no longer had these uh, voices uh, <clears throat> and experiences. But what was fascinating about her was, she said, the first thing that struck me when I no longer had these voices was a sense of loneliness. And there's two dimensions to that loneliness. And you, you sometimes hear this with people who are on medication, that their voices are dumbed down, but there's a sense of loneliness or emptiness. And there's two dimensions to her loneliness. At one level, it was because she had had this cacophony of voices for a long time, and suddenly there was silence. And because of her, her, her condition, her experiences, she hadn't really got a physical social a social network, so therefore she was lonely in that, in that sense. But the other dimension, this is similar to, to Alan, is that um, she said one of the voices that, uh, uh, that always stood up for me, you know, always spoke against the, the, the negative voices, uh, and she had a name for it, she says, uh, we kind of became friends it's an unusual thing, but we kind of became friends because she kind of was just backwards and forwards of the voices, and this one helped her and protected her sometimes. And she said, once these voices had all disappeared, I had to explain to people that I um, was grieving for someone who never existed. And she said, if I go, if I go telling people that, they're going to think I'm, I'm psychotic again. But she had to work through the fact that she no longer had that that voice, that support, whatever, where you want to put it. Um, and that was, a, that was a difficult thing for her because she, she, it was difficult for her to articulate without it simply being assumed that it was just part of her condition. Um, she worked through it, but it, it, was, it was tricky. But that, and again, that just, just, just reminded me of how important it is to, even though these experiences seem really strange and we've already been taught to think about them in particular, how important it is to, to listen and to understand what's going on from the bottom up rather than imposing what we think should be on from the top up down. Mm. And the Hearing Voices Network, is that, is that, is that yeah. the other part of the question? Yeah. The Hearing Voices Network is very interesting. It's, it's something like, I don't know, it depends on what survey you look, but something like uh, 15, 18% of the, pop, the non-psychiatric population hear voices. So people hear voices all the time, religious people hear voices all the time. Um, it, they only become problematic for the most part when they cause distress. And so it's, it's when they cause distress that they come in, people come into contact with professional services and need professional services. But the Healing Voices Network, which began in Holland in, in the 80s, um, began to recognize the, the, the common phenomenon of voice hearing. Uh, and um, began to look at the possibility that rather than simply uh, assuming that these things had to be treated um, uh, as inevitably problematic, what you, uh, one way in which you can approach people, uh, uh, not necessarily when they're deeply distressed, but one way you can approach people uh, in, in their lives is to help them to manage their voices. So people have voices, they're not particularly problematic, but you do still have to manage them. And so for those people who are able to manage their voices, and that says the Hearing Voice Network creates communities where people come together and discuss their voice hearing experiences uh, and discuss ways in which they manage that and ways in which they can live their lives um, uh, well. But the, thing, the thing that I find really interesting about looking into all that, that is that there seems to be more people in the non-psychiatric population who hear voices than people who are under professional care. So it shifts your perspective a little bit on, on voices and voice hearing. Yeah, thank you. One of the things that I love about 
your book and about your work in general is how you're you're not uh, anti psychiatry and you're not against mental health treatment you're not against diagnosis and you make that very clear in the book uh, but you are always cautioning against the way that labels and medical frameworks can actually make us not able to see and appreciate and hear uh, the nuances and complexities of people's experience and also to talk about things like belonging and love that I think you've just spoken about. And um, we've talked some about how the clinical language and maybe neurobiological language can lead to thin description. But one of the subtexts of this book is how spirituality can also function as thin description. And I just want to ask you about that. Like, wh how, what do you mean by that? I thought spirituality was the answer to all of this and was supposed to be holistic and, you know, the cure. What's wrong with what can be wrong with the language of spirituality in this respect? One of the problems that can be covered with language of spirituality is it can be, be too thin. Now, I'll explain to you thick and thin. But, so Clifford Geertz, is an anthropologist, talks about thick and thin descriptions. So a thin description uh, of a wink, for example, is that you, you've the certain muscular movements that close the eyelid and open it up and the certain excretions, et cetera, et cetera. A thicker description has to do with you seeing somebody, recognizing them, acknowledging who they are, winking to them, communicating in that sense. So you've got a big thick description there of, of what's going on. Uh, so that's thick and thin. Now, my, my, my ch challenge problem with uh, certain modes of spirituality is it's just too thin. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's too thin, at least in Europe, I mean, and I don't know what it's like in, in, in your context, um, but I suspect it may be similar, is that uh, spirituality is shaped and formed by the parameters of the institution. And so if, within the um, United Kingdom, you have the National Health Service, which is designed to give everybody free health care at the point of, of access. Um, but by definition, that everybody means you've got a huge broad range of people. And so you have to have, you have to have a, a system that works on generalities. So you can't have an antibiotic that works for one person. You have to work for everybody. Um, likewise, you can't have a spirituality that only works for one person that has to work for everybody. And so what tends to happen is that your definition of spirituality gets thinned down to meaning kind of vague definitions of spirituality is meaning, purpose, value, hope, and for some people, God, which is great because it, it raises people's consciousness to aspects of the healthcare system, which we might not notice otherwise. But it's not so great if you try to talk about the particularities of any religious tradition. And you know, if you talk about the particularities of uh, Christianity, for example, it can cause all sorts of problems within the institution uh, in terms of people's response to you. If you have a secular healthcare system, then you're, you're speaking a different kind of language. And, but, it's, but it's quite interesting because that's actually the, very often the specifics of a person's religion, the prayer, pray the, who they pray to, the expectation that brings about you know, well-being in that sense, but it's very difficult to, to incorporate that. And so you end up with a, a, quite a thin definition of spirituality, which tends to be, uh, look remarkably like um, Maslow's idea of self-actualization. You know, my meaning, my purpose, my value, my, and so it's very individual. And so the community, whatever community you are, wasn't really part of that anymore. So it's a useful definition. And, uh, and I do wonder whether I've made that clear enough in that book. It's a useful way of thinking about things because it raises your consciousness to certain aspects. But at the same time, it's just too thin to do the, the work that many people needed to do. Thank you. Thank you. So I get several clear messages in this book so far. One is don't reduce people to their diagnoses. Um, another is listen for the complexity of people's experience. Another is the just deep need for love and belonging among people who live with mental health challenges. Um, I want to just ask a couple of quest final questions before we open it up to the group conversation about your last chapter on healing, on the nature of healing. And just a couple of things I would just uh, just name that I found really beautiful. You say that what you're after in this book is a theology that drops down into the heart, which is a phrase that you get from your colleague, Bethany McKinney Fox. And you also say that the test of a good theology is not simply in its intellectual coherence, 
but the way that it enables the people of God to see God more clearly and love God more dearly. So I don't really have a question about that. I just think it's beautiful. And I wanted just to, you know, to offer your words back and, and to say, I think that really helps our, our conversation. But I do have a couple of questions. You do say that health, and this, this I found very challenging as a physician and a psychiatrist, health is not a medical or psychological concept, but primarily a relational and theological concept. So what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, years ago, I, I did my PhD thesis on uh, schizophrenia and Christian friendship. Uh, and part of that work was to look at what health in general and mental health in particular looked like from a biblical perspective. And it's interesting because there's, you know, there's no equivalent term in scripture for the kind of biomedical uh, understanding of health that we work with, health, i.e. health is the absence of illness. The closest word seems to be shalom, which uh, has to do with justice, righteousness, holiness, right relationship with, with God. So to be healthy is to be in right relationship with God. And that means that, you know, in terms of end of life care, for example, you can be dying uh, and, uh, and be extremely healthy and more healthy than an Olympic athlete who just lives a hedonistic lifestyle. Um, but it also means that you can, um, you can live well with enduring mental health challenges. Uh, uh, you know, that is ch mental health challenges that are not going to go away. You can live well with them even in the midst of that, because your goal is not to get rid of this, that, you know, the great, perhaps, if that's possible. The question is, how do you live well with it? How do you hold on to God in the midst of it? And that seems to me that that's the, the fundamental pastoral question that we should be asking. How do we enable people to live well in the midst of it? So you get that tension between curing and healing. So to cure is to take away something, to, to eradicate the passport, to heal is, is more to um, find yourself, your right relationship with God. So if you think about the, the Samaritan, the, the, the woman with the issue of blood in the Gospels, she touches Jesus' cloak and she's cured. Yeah? But at the end of the story, when she kind of recognizes who he is, Jesus says, your faith has made me heal. Your, your faith has, has healed you. Now, that healing there seems to me very close to the idea of shalom, that you're, you, now you see who God is, now you can live your life in community in that way. And so that, that's, that's where that, that idea comes from. And I think it's quite helpful because it just gives people the opportunity to, uh, to deal creatively with long-term conditions. Thank you. Thank you.